Uh, good morning. Good morning. Right. I was a little worried that you were going to answer um, kind of like a budget meeting on Monday morning, but you guys are, are ready to go and a very engaged audience and, and great to see you. Thank, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, probably booked this like two years ago or so. Um, and so we have to plan ahead sometimes, and uh, I really appreciate being here. Um, I was looking up uh, during, during uh, Tim's talk, the, the last time I was here in New Jersey, um, the last time I was here was, was um, speaking to the state beekeepers group um, in 2006. So it's been a while since I've been here, so it's nice to be back. But I also want to congratulate you guys that um, at that state meeting, there were 35 people in the audience. And you guys have, what are you pushing, 200? What are you guys at? More than 35, I can count. Um, but yeah, so really, it's really great to see such a vibrant group, and I, and I appreciate uh, being part of it. So um, thank you again for, for having me. Now, um, I, and I also really think you guys have a great resource with Tim and, and all of the, really, the apiary inspectors nationwide. We're, they're just the real unsung heroes for, for what we do and, and really indispensable. Uh, but there's a division of labor when it comes to the regulatory side of things, you know, you guys as the beekeeper and the political side of things and, and for what we do in research. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to take a really different approach and, and talk about some of the things that we do from the scientific side. And in doing so, I, I want to um, really get on my soapbox for a couple things. One is that without kind of a basic understanding of the bee's biology, you're never going to be a good beekeeper. So this is a mantra that I really, really push home, is that um, you, you can be a decent beekeeper by knowing you know, what you need to do, what time of year, but you're never going to be a great beekeeper unless you understand what's going on inside the colony. Because the nuances and the variation from colony to colony are so tremendous that it really takes that, that thorough understanding of the bees as a biological community with themselves and with the mites and everything else that's going on, that you really need to understand that um, in order to be a good beekeeper, right? The second uh, mantra is, is to see how science and our thorough understanding of bee biology, it takes a lot of thorough investigation to be able to apply that knowledge that we've gained in some sort of practical way. So um, the presentation this morning is going to be kind of um, a thorough understanding of the bee biology, and in fact, of the queen bee biology. But then this afternoon, we'll see how that basic understanding of the queens has then enabled us to translate that into a new initiative that is available for all beekeepers to measure the queens and be able to benefit from that understanding of queen biology, okay? So, um, so I just want to remind that, the, that these uh, presentations are really linked in, uh, from the morning and afternoon, assuming you don't forget everything over lunch. Okay, so um, when I'm talking about the, the benefits of genetic diversity within colonies, what we're really going to be talking about is the mating biology of queens and just the overall kind of reproductive biology of bees in general. And so um, I want to step back a little bit and, and talk a little bit about the history of how we've viewed queens over the years, okay? So I'll go way back, in fact, and talk about Aristotle, okay? So over 2,000 years ago, probably the best natural historian of all times, uh, Aristotle, wrote this text called uh, The History of Animals. And in doing so, about half of the pages in that kind of great Greek text was devoted to honeybees. Right? He was one of the, the best uh, natural historians of bees and, and really 
did a lot to advance our understanding of how the colony works. And he got a lot of things right. He identified you know, the pollen versus the nectar foragers, um, division of labor within the colony and how the bees worked with each other. Um, but he got a lot wrong too. Um, he, for example, said that the foragers, because they were relatively hairless, because you know, as they get older, they, all their hair gets knocked off. He said that those were the young bees, and then the, the ones that were hairier, those were the older bees, because they went through puberty or something, right? <laughs> so, um, but we now know that that's actually not accurate, right? But another critical um, error that he made was that he did notice that there was this one special bee within the colony, and that bee didn't do any labor, didn't do any work, like all the others, um, so that must have been the leader. And of course, the leader of a society had to be a male. So um, he concluded, right, that that one special individual was the king, right? Now, um, the other aspect is that, you know, they never saw this king having relations. I'm in a church, so I need to watch my uh, phraseology here, right? And so is um, part of the reproductive biology, you know, they never really understood how bees made babies in, in a way. And um, the, Ro the Roman poet Virgil kind of summed up what Aristotle uh, surmised in, in his text and in a very, very common belief um, of the time. And he said that, Bees indulge not in conjugal, conjugal embraces, nor idly unnerve their bodies in love, right? Or bring forth youth with travail. In other words, they don't, give, they don't go through labor, right? But themselves gather their children in their mouths from leaves and sweet herbs. <laughs> the idea here was that when bees were going out and foraging and collecting their food, they weren't just getting nectar and pollen, they were going to flowers where the bees, the eggs, would rain down from heaven like manna, and they would collect the eggs and bring them back, and that's how they made new bees. So bees were spiritual, they were heavenly, right? And they were divorced from, what was it, the conjugal embraces, right? So. Bees were, in fact, viewed as chaste, as partially heavenly, right? And something to aspire to. Don't, you know, you think lustful thoughts, be like the bees, and, you know, be pure. Seriously, this is, you know. And this was a view that colonies were ruled by kings that were chaste, and therefore, you know, uh, religiously pure. That was something that was held up for about two millennia. This is how bees were viewed for most of human history, okay? Now, um, it came along then in the, uh, uh, in the 1700s, Charles Butler, you've heard of him, one famous beekeeper in, throughout history, um, he wrote a text called The Feminine Monarchy, where finally it was admitted that this king was not in fact a king, but a queen, because he saw the queens lay eggs. So this, this story of the chaste kings heading our colonies was kind of finally overturned, and it happened to be during the Elizabethan era, right? When it was okay to have a monarchy ruled by a female, right? So now it was okay. But still, up until that point, um, the you know, people that were looking, the beekeepers and, and others that were looking at how, um, you know, bees made babies, they couldn't quite figure out how things so worked. So it wasn't until the 1940s, believe it or not, that scientists in the USDA um, actually figured out how queens went about mating. And it, up until that point, you know, queens were assumed to mate with drones inside the hive once. What happened is that they, they watched queens 
when they're very young and they watch them take multiple mating flights and uh, therefore demonstrated that queens mate with multiple drones. Right? And this is what our discussion is going to be for the rest of the morning before you get back to the Danish. Right? So it took us about 2,000 years, but we went from this concept that colonies were ruled by asexual kings to now queens who are sowing their royal oats quite over and over again. Okay? So, so a little bit about then the queen mating biology and, and again, eventually get to why this is important to you as a beekeeper. Okay. So, for the most part, queens' lives are exceedingly boring, right? They don't do any of the work. All they do, for the most part, is lay eggs. That's their primary function in the colony. Of course, there's lots of other things that they provide, of course, but as far as the labor goes, that's kind of their thing. Laying an egg up to 1,800 times a day, which is twice their own body weight, by the way, in eggs, which is pretty fascinating. So, but there is this very brief period in their lives when there's lots of excitement going on when it comes to queens. And this is usually associated with swarming, right? So the old mother queen departs the nest with about 75% of the adult workers. It's not splitting in half, it's an uneven split, right? So a good swarm has about 75% of the workers. And they go and cluster in the tree and they move into your neighbor's soffit and you know, the rest is history. But what's going on back inside the colony is that there are one or two or sometimes more daughter queens that are being raised, right? So these are queen cells that you see. And when they emerge, they fight to the death until only one remains, right? It can only be one queen per colony. So just like the Kardashians, they fight each other until there's one that succeeds, right? This process is actually very fascinating in and of itself of how the queens battle each other, how they trick workers into, you know, coax, or how they, you know, coax workers into helping out their cause, and some of them go and hide rather than fight, and so there's this complex thing that's going on, but in the end, the queens duke it out with each other until there's one left. And this takes sometimes a week inside a colony, so it can take some time. But what happens is that victorious princess queen, when she's about a week old, engages in mating behavior. And I have to apologize here, I usually have um, a, uh, a video that actually shows this, but given that I'm in a church, I'm glad we're not seeing the act um, <laughs> of, of queens here. But what ends up happening is that that victorious queen, when she's about a week old, in afternoons only, when it's very nice weather out, will fly from the hive and about a mile away, and she mates with many drones in rapid succession, um, and it takes usually about 15, 20 minutes, depending on how far she flies, and then she'll come back to the colony, and about 50% of the time, that's it. She won't fly from the hive again, uh, about another 50% of the time, she'll take a second or even third mating flight on the next days. And then again, once she's finished mating with all of these drones, she stores a proportion of each of, his, of, the, of her mate's sperm in this special organ called the spermatheca. We've heard this in B-School. Um, and so she is being inseminated by all of these different males. And then once she starts laying eggs, she'll never mate again, ever again. All right, so this is her one you know, period of sowing her royal oats. So, and this usually happened the first two weeks of her life. And then once she starts laying eggs, then her you know, one, two, three year lifespan is exceedingly boring. And she's using that stored sperm to fertilize the eggs every time she lays them. Mm -hmm. 
Do the workers go out with the queen on her mating flight? Nope, uh, they do not. They often usher her out the front entrance and welcome her back, but they do not go with her. Uh, the queens and the drones fly to these uh, kind of pre-agreed areas, these kind of aerial singles bars of drones, right? And then queens fly through them. Um, we really don't, they're called drone congregation areas, right? We don't really know where they form, why they form, and how the bees agree that these are good places to hook up, um, but they know it somehow. And so wherever they're placed, they will go and they will find these places where they mate. less than that. So the question was, queens fly about a mile. They fly further than the drones. Now why is that? Why would a queen want to avoid mating with drones locally? For inbreeding, right? Who would they be mating with? Not their sons, their brothers. Exactly right. Well, again, because we don't really understand how and where drone congregation areas form, even though they're very stable in both time and space, the, the uh, can I back up? Yeah. So this picture right here was taken by a researcher at UC Davis named Norm Gary in the 1960s who filmed b -sex which is why I'm glad I didn't have the movie. Um, but he, you know, he filmed that. When I was a graduate student out there in the late 90s, that drone congregation area was still there. Different bees, different, everything was different, but that drone congregation area was still there. Yep. Same thing? Mm -hmm. It's not a, they're, the queens may not have as good eyesight, but they have good enough eyesight to find these places. Absolutely. So somehow they're able to do it. It's remarkable. It really is. There was another hand up over there, sorry. Yeah, so the, it's, really, it's really amazing. We've watched hundreds and hundreds of queens on their mating flights. And, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, and I'm pretty soon going to have a teenage daughter. Some of them are just wanting to go out and, you know, others kind of have to get forced out. Um, and the bees are the same way. That the, Sometimes they will drag, uh, you know, kick, queens kicking and screaming to go mate. Others, others are very willing to do so themselves. So yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating to watch the personalities of different queens as well. There's another question here before we get to... So the question was, is there variation from site to site in kind of the mating success of queens? Um, and I'd kiss you, but I wouldn't be on camera anymore. Because um, that's in essence what we're going to be talking about here, is that the, the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, what I hope to convince you is that, you know, greater mating equals increased genetic diversity and equals a better colony. 
So you do see that, and it's something that is invisible to us as beekeepers, but it has profound effects on the quality of your colonies. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that's a, that's a very key point here, is that, you know, increasing the mating number of your queens is not something that you necessarily have direct control over, but have indirect control over, and it's something that can profoundly affect your colonies. Now, measuring how many times a queen mates is kind of difficult, right? Because they do this a mile away, 50 feet up in the air, in rapid succession with different drones, and as the video was supposed to show you, um, the drones die in the act, right? We all knew this, yes? Um, the reason why, you know, the 18th century scientists couldn't really figure out how queens and drones would mate is because they didn't realize that the drone had to turn himself inside out, literally, in order to inseminate the queen. That's pretty traumatic to the drone, as if it would be for us, right? So guys, be thankful we don't have to turn ourselves inside out, uh, literally, figuratively, maybe. Um, but the number of mates, so the way that, that we can tell how many times a queen mates is very difficult directly, but we can do it indirectly, all right? The way that this is done is that every time a queen lays an egg, she fertilizes it from one of the many mates that she has, and so that egg and the worker that derives from that egg has a genetic signature from both the mother and the father. So the mother's the same for everybody, but the fathers are different. So you can go into a colony, sample the workers, and do a genetic paternity test on them. Find out who their daddy is, right? And then count up the number of different daddies within a colony, and that's how many times a queen mates, right? So when you, we look at that across all sorts of different colonies, we see, you know, some queens only mate once or twice. The average is about 12 or so drones. Some queens have been estimated to mate upwards of 45, 50 times. And that's what I tell my undergrads, that's where we get the term busy as a bee, okay? So, there's a lot of variation in mating success, mating numbers among queens. Right? Now, what's really amazing about this, what's fascinating, is that a single drone can inseminate a queen with about 10 million sperm. A queen spermatheca can really only physically house about five to seven million sperm. So one drone is sufficient to supply her with enough sperm to, to, to lay and fertilize those eggs, right? So why on earth, and this has been a, a mystery, an enigma for, for many, many years, ever since it was discovered that queens mate upwards of 45 times, why do they do that if one drone is enough? Because right? it's more fun. That's the leading explanation. Right? Perhaps the most obvious. But there are other potential reasons, right? And so this is where kind of trying to understand that kind of basic understanding of, of why queens mate with many when one is enough. And so um, I'm going to go through several um, potential reasons and, and showing some evidence of some scientific experiments of why that is, okay? But, but in general, I just want to show um, through this, this generic concept of why this is actually helpful, all right? And in doing so, I, don't, I, th I hope we have time for this, but let's go through a little exercise where we're going to show how that multiple mating and the genetic diversity is helpful because it helps queens hedge their bets against mating with one dud, all right? In doing so, we actually have a, we have a room here where we have three kind of nice demarcated groups, all right? So we're going to get involved here, all right? So I want you to take out a coin. It doesn't matter what coin, if it's a penny or a quarter or whatever. And if you don't have one, ask an old guy. This is a beekeeper group, after all. Over here, I want you guys to flip your head. You can have one. You can do it in teams if you want. We need a flipper and a counter, right? 
This group over here, you flip the coin once. What we're all going to do is we're going to count the number of heads that we flip. Okay? All right. You guys flip your coin once. You guys here, you flip your coin four times. All right? Count the number of heads. And then you guys, you flip your coins 12 times. Count the number of heads. All right? We got this? It's just counting. We should all be able to do this. Any money that goes under the floor goes to Tim's research fund. All right? <laughs> Any coins that are dropped. OK, so you guys only flipping once, it should be pretty quick, right? And what did I say? Four times? And then 12 times. All right, count the number of heads. OK, now th this is, well, as you're doing this, hopefully you can listen and count. This is similar, this is analogous to queen mating number, right? So these are queens that mate once, these are queens that mate four times, these are queens that mate 12 times. I'm not making any judgment or moral decisions based on where you are, okay? But this, think of this as sampling the drones from a drone congregation area, right? And then think that those drones are passing on their genes to your offspring, the workers within the colony that you're going to have, right? And so if you flip the coin only once, you mate with one drone, whatever genes and genetics that he's carrying are being expressed and passed on to your kids, right? So what this model, what this kind of um, conceptual model is, is that if you mate with one drone, and he's great, he has great genes, he's free of parasites, he, you know, the colony makes a lot of honey because his genes are being conferred to your workers, then that's like getting ahead. That's like winning the lottery, right? But if it's a dud, dud drone, full of disease, good for nothing, you know, unemployed, whatever, <laughs> there, then that's a tails, right? So if you flip the coin only once, what's the chances that your colony is going to survive? 50-50, all right? So how many of you flipped zero heads over here? That's not half of you. OK, how many of you flipped um, one, one heads? OK, so again, it's about 50, should be 50-50. I don't know if you guys, right? <laughs> Should be 50-50 over here, right? So the ones that flip the tails, your colonies don't survive. The ones that flip the heads, your colonies survive, all right? Over here, how many of you flipped zero heads? That is all tails, okay? Two out of 47, okay. How many flip one heads? Two heads, three heads, all four. Now, in order to survive, you have to have at least one heads, right? So here, rather than 50-50 surviving, there was only two out of the 47 that, um, that died off, okay? Make sense? How about over here? How many of you flipped zero heads out of 12? Nobody, right? How about one heads only? Two, three, four, Okay, five, six, that's the average that you would expect, right? Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, or 12. Those are statistically improbable. If you would have gotten those, you should go out and buy a lottery ticket. All right, now, that's like mating many times. How many of them had no, they mated with all duds, all tails? None, right? So exceedingly rare to mate with all duds, right? It's exceedingly rare to have all studs, okay? So the idea of mating multiple times by queens is helpful because it assures that they don't mate with all duds. And it makes it likely, if not absolutely certain, that at least a good proportion of the colony are being fathered by studs. Does that make sense? So this is risky. You're taking, you know, 50-50 shot of surviving. This is less risky because you're now mating with lots of drones. Some of them may be good, 
Some may be bad, but on average, your colony is going to be better off in the middle. You get it? Understand? So it's the same, the same thing, the same principle of hedging their bets by mating with lots of drones. There's a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a critically important question. How do they know if it's a dud or a stud? They don't. That's exactly why, if they knew, then they wouldn't have to go to all that trouble. So if they came with name tags or they did you know, speed dating or something, then they'd be able to ascertain for themselves. But they're flying through the air. The drones are mating with them in rapid succession, you know, only bursts of several seconds. I shouldn't have said burst. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> But because they can't choose, they mate with many so that they can be assured it doesn't matter. All right? So they, they are storing the sperm. They're storing the sperm from all of them, right? It does, almost evenly. So it's, every time she lays an egg, it's a random, pretty much a random process of who sires that. It's not like the first drone that mated with her sires all the offspring until his sperm run out, then the next drone, it's not sequential, it's mixed. So at any given time, the colony is composed of the cosmopolitan population of all of those drones and all of their different genetics. That's where the genetic diversity comes in, okay? Correct. What can you do, if anything, to try to promote the best offspring if you have no control over half the genetics? Correct. So the question was, how do you control the drone side of things genetically if you're selecting for different traits? It's very difficult. Um, and the only way to do you have control somewhat over the queen side of things. But if she's just mating with whomever, what you have to do, very simply, is get all of your local uh, beekeepers in a particular area to agree on the same thing. Easy. No problem, right? No problem. So that's all you have to do. No, that, that's what makes breed breeding difficult, in fact, um, and, and a real challenge historically. And that's what makes this instrumental insemination a very powerful tool, okay? Um, so I won't, I won't go, I could go on and on with that, with that answer, but um, let, me, let me just uh, try and show you some of the process and the scientific um, studies that we've done to show why this is really important, okay? So using instrumental insemination, we can control very accurately the number and the type of the drones that queens are inseminated with, right? Rather than having no control over it by them mating naturally. And so this is where genetics becomes really important in really understanding who's mating with who and what's going on internally um, of what makes the colony strong or weak, all right? So many of you probably know or remember that queens and workers derive from fertilized eggs, right? And that drones derive from unfertilized eggs, right? So drones don't have fathers, they only have mothers. Okay, that's what we learned in B school and we all remember that. But it's actually only half the truth, believe it or not, okay? Drones can come from fertilized eggs. So what really makes a female versus a male is not the chromosome number, fertilization or not. It's actually a single gene, okay? This is pretty wild. Right? We're used to these X and Y chromosomes, right? And that's what gives us gender. Um, but in bees and ants and, and others that are related to them, they have this single gene. It's called the sex locus because it determines sex, all right? And there's lots of different alleles, lots of different types of this gene at this locus, right? So we have a gene for eye color but different alleles, blue, red, green, not red. Who has red eyes? Um, blue, brown, <laughs> green, right? So the different forms of this, right? 
And so there can be sometimes dozens of these sex genes, sex alleles out there. And so when a queen here has two different types, two different alleles at that gene, mates with a drone that has one type, right? When she makes worker offspring, those workers are going to have two different forms of this gene, and they develop normally, 100% viable, okay? So to be heterozygous, that is you have two different forms of this gene, you're going to be female. But if a queen happens to mate with a drone, again, no name tags, no way for her to know, but if she ha mates with a drone that has one of her, the two sex alleles that she has, okay? In this case, she's X1, X2, he's X2, right? Half of the time, she's going to lay an egg and the fertilized egg will be X2, X2. So it's going to have two copies of the same allele, all right? Still awake? All right. The, that confers maleness. So there you have a fertilized egg, but it still develops into a male because there isn't diversity at this one gene. You need to be, you need to have two copies to be female, two different types, right? And so here you can have a queen mated with a drone, but half of her offspring are inviable. Anybody ever seen shot brood within your colonies? That can, can be, not always, but it can be an indication that the queen happened to mate with, in her case, a dud. That is a dud because she ha he happens to have this allele that she shares. And this can confer the worst case of inbreeding that you would ever see. Not necessarily mating with a brother or a cousin or anything like that, but mating with a drone that happens to have this particular gene that results in shot brood, okay? So this is your tails, right? This is a heads, this is a tails. So that can be really, really problematic for the colony. And so what you see when queens mate once there's a very high proportion likelihood that she's going to mate with one of these drones that's going to, in essence, kill her colony. But if she mates four or 16 or 12 times or 20 times, the likelihood that she mates with all males that have one of her two alleles is exceedingly low, in fact, impossible. This is that bet hedging thing again, right? So, it's, this, is, this is an incredibly powerful genetic mechanism that's inescapable to the, that's how they determine male or femaleness, right? But it can co cause a real problem if the queen only mates once. So if she mates multiple times, it's not gonna be a problem. So if we look, in fact, at um, kind of uh, experimentally derived variation in brood viability, right, from 50% to 100%, and we look at colonies that have different levels of brood viability and see how well those colonies develop. This shouldn't be a surprise to any of you, but those that have low brood viability have very poor population buildup and don't do as well. Those with average or high brood viability do do fine, right? So it's better to be average sometimes than it is to be best at the risk of being worst, right? That, that hedging thing again. If we look at the survival, um, all of the colonies that have high brood viability survive. Those that have low brood viability, it's about 50-50. Again, this is all because of mating once versus multiple times, right? So that's one benefit to mating multiple times, having genetically diverse offspring. There's another benefit that can also help colonies. You may have heard that honeybees have diseases. Uh, and there's lots of them, right? 
uh, Tim was talking at length, as he should, about public enemy number one, uh, Varroa mites. But there's lots of others, right? And we all know those as well. Um, and so diseases can be very problematic, and we know that there's genetic control over disease resistance. So rather than this sexy oil thing, there can be genetic resistance for diseases as well. So we did another study where we artificially inseminated queens, whoops, sorry, with one drone versus uh, taking a single drone from the same colonies that we inseminated those other queens with and mixed their semen and then inseminated those queens with one male's worth of that mixture, right? So all queens were inseminated with the same amount. They got the same amount of sperm, but in one case, the colony, the workers in the colony all had the same father. In the other case, the workers in the colony came from, in this, 24 different fathers, right? So single drone inseminated versus multiple drone inseminated. So genetically uniform, genetically diverse, right? And then we pl place these queens out into colonies, let the populations turned over, and then did something that you are absolutely not allowed to do, otherwise Tim will burn your colonies for you, and that is purposely give them American Falbird, okay? We took some scale, right, from a colony that died of American foul brood, mushed it up, put it into a sugar syrup, and sprayed it directly on the brood combs, okay? Hey, we're scientists, man. We can do this. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you, do, you really wouldn't want to, because, uh, you know, we had to burn the colonies at the end, so, you know, but all to try and understand something about the bees. And then, and this was done in collaboration with Tom Seeley at Cornell, uh, who's one of the architects of, of proposing this could be a benefit of queens mating multiply. Um, he then measured the amount of AFB in these colonies after five and then nine uh, weeks after they were inoculated, and then also measured how strong the colonies got um, at, at the end of the season. What we found is, again, a benefit of queens that were multiply inseminated versus singly inseminated. So just to walk you through these graphs, um, SDI, single drone inseminated, these are queens that mated with only one male. MDI, multiple drone inseminated, these are queens that were inseminated with 24 males. And then the top one is AFB infection after five weeks, and then the bottom one is AFB infection after nine weeks. So as you can see, while the multiple drone inseminated colonies still did get some levels of American foul brood, it was kind of held in check. It wasn't a sweeping infection throughout the colony. For those headed by single drone inseminated queens, some of them did fine. Some of them never developed American foul brood, even though we, we give them the snot of, uh, you know, we, we gave them a lot of spores, all right? And they still were symptom free, which is cool for them. That was flipping the heads. But some of them flipped the tails, and they really developed these horrible sweeping infections over time, and the colonies would obviously succumb to that. So the y-axis is the intensity of American foul brood. So going in frame by frame and just counting the number of cells that were symptomatic of the disease, right? So the brown, gooey larvae and, you know, um, so just clearly, obviously dying from American foul brood. Yeah. You're the biology major, aren't you? <laughs> so she correctly pointed out that it's not just the means that are different, but as I pointed out over here, the variance, right, is the difference between the worst and the best. That's also greater, right? That's what this model here predicts, is that the average is the same, but it's the variance that's really important. Um, so it's a uh, fulfillment of that overall concept, right? Um, it's not necessarily the average infection, but it's the, the variance 
of between the two groups. That's important. Yeah. Very keen, very good. Um, so the take home message though is that it's this bet hedging principle of the queen doesn't know she's going to mate with a drone that is horribly susceptible or passing on genes that's horribly susceptible to American foul brood. Because she can't know that, mating with lots of them ensures that the colony is going to be over. If they do come into contact with American foul brood, it's not going to be this sweeping infection where everybody dies off. Only a sub portion of the colony dies off, but the rest of the colony survives. Okay, in the back. So that's a good question. Did we do anything like this with Varroa mites? We have not, others have, and they don't really show as large of an effect. Why might that be? Anybody? There's not, sorry? So they're an external parasite. They're not native to our bees. And we don't have the same um, alleles out there for resistance, at least, right? So they are starting to become much more prevalent in our population, but they're not quite the same as a co-evolved pathogen like American foul brood, okay? So it's starting to become more prevalent, but it's not quite as high. That's a great question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. We did, not actually in this study, um, but we did test for hygienic behavior, and it shows the same thing. Hygienic behavior is a genetically um, uh, controlled trait. And so if you have um, only one mate within the colony, your colony is either hygienic or not. But if you mate with lots, your colony is going to be like 90% hygienic and not as variable, right? So again, it's, it, this same principle holds for anything that has genetic control over that phenotype. Disease, hygienic behavior, um, uh, the, the sex, the, the diploid drone, right? So there, this is a comprehensive benefit of mating multiply. Okay. Now, I realize that I'm starting to run out of time and I don't want to be between you and Danish because that's a very dangerous place to be. So I will try and um, talk a little bit more about some other consequences of this multiple mating, right? We all know that, as I said before, queens are egg-laying machines, and that's not doing them justice because they also provide a suite of pheromones that helps hold the society together, right? And so we're not only looking at what happens to colonies of queens headed by well-mated queens versus not well-mated queens, we're also looking at the effect on individual queens and how good they are um, as a consequence of mating multiply, right? So this is a collaboration done with um, Christina Grosinger's lab when she was still down at uh, NC State before she moved to Penn State several years ago. Um, we're looking at the pheromone profiles and the attractiveness of queens, whether they were inseminated with one or multiple drones. And what we found, you take these SDI and MDI queens and you put them into observation hives, and you look at how many workers are surrounding the queen in the queen's court, right? The retinue response. And we know that that's a pheromone-driven thing, that queens, queens are producing this pheromone, the workers are attracted to the queen, so you take the queen and you count the number of workers that are kind of licking and grooming and, you know, taking care of her royalty, right? And what you find is that queens that only have one mate tend to have fewer workers over time that are tending to her versus queens that were multiply inseminated. Interesting. So workers seem to be less attracted to queens that are not fully inseminated. We took this further and we dissected out the glands that produce those pheromones and we gave workers choice tests like Pepsi and Coke, right? 
Do they even do that anymore? <laughs> Maybe not. Um, so we look at single drone inseminated queens versus virgin queens, those that haven't been mated at all, and they prefer the single drone inseminated queens. If you look at the virgin queens versus the multiple drone inseminated queens, again, they prefer the mated queen over the non-mated queen. But if you look at the choice between single drone inseminated queens and multiple drone inseminated queens, they prefer, just like the retinue observation hive results, they prefer queens that are mated more. So this is actually really important because what it's suggesting is that the queen's mating status is being reflected in her pheromones. And the workers can somehow tell through her pheromones whether or not the queen has been mated well enough. What do you think happens if the queen isn't mated well enough and they smell that on the queen? Potential increased likelihood of her being superseded and getting a new... So the workers are actually using this signal, this pheromonal signal, to be able to tell, oh, we don't have a very good queen, we need a new one. We know she's not very good because she didn't mate well enough, and that is going to have potential consequences on the colony, right? We might come down with disease, and we might not build up and swarm, so we need to get a better queen. Interesting. Um, so this is just another pretty picture to show pretty much the same data that these we, we did a chemical analysis and actually showed that these pheromones themselves are chemically distinct. So not only are the workers able to tell the difference and prefer well-mated queens, we can, using chemical analyses, say, yeah, there's a chemical difference in the pheromone profile of well-mated queens versus poorly-mated queens. We went a step further and used a lot of these fancy-schmancy genetic techniques where we could look at every single gene expressed by the queen that were well-mated, poorly-mated, or virgin queens. And we can actually look gene by gene, which genes are getting turned on, which ones are getting turned off, as a result of queens mating well or not, right? So really powerful stuff, we're able to show the different genes that are being affected because of queens mating. And I won't go into that at all, sorry, yes. So this is true when given the choice test between a single drone inseminated queen and a virgin queen, right? right? But that's, those are different cages, those are different bees, right? So the overall level here, the universal level, is not as important as the difference in the choice. So really here, the choice between the single and the multiple drone inseminated queen, they clearly prefer the multiply inseminated queen. So I guess I bring all of this up to show that this is really important to understand the kind of the inner workings of what makes a good queen. And this series of studies is really showing that a fully mated, well-mated queen that has a diversity of different drones is really, really important to the queen and her colony, all right? So without knowing that, we just look and, you know, oh, the queen's pretty. Oh, no. Well, that's not, you know, there's a lot of invisible things going on within the colony that, af that affects your colony and your queen because of her mating success or lack thereof. Right? So understanding that, um, what I hope to uh, present this afternoon is how we've taken this basic understanding of the queen biology and translated that into the management of queens and ways that we can measure queens in these same ways to try and hedge our bets as beekeepers to make sure that we wind up with better queens than the, the really bad ones. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, great question. How do we determine whether it's genetic or epigenetic? Um, and 
I, again, could go off on, on that you know, in, in many ways, but it's really hard to distinguish those two. Um, and so for certain traits, we're able to, to do that. For other traits, we just assume, right? So um, we do know, for example, that that distinction between becoming a worker or a queen is actually driven more by epigenetics than it is genetics. In fact, we know that it's the same genome that develops into a worker or a queen, right? So it's the regulation of the genes, not so much different genes, right? But that's very, very complicated. And in fact, why studies like this and looking at the, at the genomic level is really, really helpful to distinguish that, um, but it's incredibly complicated. Yeah. Sorry, back. So I'm setting that up. So the question was, is there anything we can do as beekeepers to hedge this? And that's what, so make sure you come back after lunch, because that's what we're going to talk about, right? So, you know, what are the things that we can do? There are some things that we can do. It's, it's difficult, right? Because these are invisible traits for the most part. Um, oftentimes, you know, we really don't have a lot of control over it, but there are things that we can look out for, things that we can measure to try and understand that exactly right. So the observation was, you know, poorly mated queen um, and multiple eggs per cell, that's a telltale symptom of laying workers. Not always, I should mention, but it, sometimes new queens do what I call pop the clutch. <laughs> kind of like new drivers. I have a 15 year old. And sometimes they get overzealous and they can lay eggs, multiple eggs in a cell. Um, so that can happen, but other times, especially when the, the um, eggs are laid on the side because they can't reach all the way to the bottom, it's a telltale sign of laying workers. So um, that can happen when a colony replaces its queen, often prematurely, this is, again, something we'll talk about this afternoon, that this is ever increasing in, in beekeeping where queens are supposed to live two, three years. Sometimes they're superseded in a month or two, right? Sometimes that supersedure is not successful and you can wind up with laying workers. So you're seeing eggs, but they're not the queen's eggs because she's long gone. So these are all big problems. Um, and how many, show of hands, how many people have you know, queens that have been superseded within the first year. Happens a lot. 10, 15, 20 years ago, you yeah, ask the same question, be far, far fewer hands. So that is something we'll be talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it can be attributed to lots of things. Uh, and so the exploration this afternoon that we'll talk about is I went into it thinking, well, superseded early, they're not, they're laying in viable eggs, all telltale symptoms of queens not mating enough. We know that queens need to mate a lot, right? Sometimes that's true, other times it's not. So distinguishing those things I think is really important. Mm -hmm. So the question was, how does that work in practice, that a queen mates many times, that her body's able to sense the increased diversity and then express that through the pheromones? 
thank you for that, because this is part of my favorite aspect of this study that I didn't really go into. We not only inseminated queens with different uh, numbers of drones, we inseminated queens as a control with different, the same volumes of saline. And what ended up happening is that the queen's pheromone profiles mimicked the um, insemination volume, whether it was semen or saline. In other words, the sperm are not telling the queen, hey, we're really diverse in here, right? When she goes on her mating flights, she gets filled up with, if a single drone can provide 10 million sperm, but only 5 million fit, she has a lot of excess, right? So she comes back from her mating flight with her abdomen incredibly distended with a lot of volume of semen, most of which is expelled. Only a very small proportion of the sperm migrate into the spermatheca. So what our studies have found is that it's that act of distension that then triggers this kind of hormonal and physiological cascade to say, I've made it enough, time to start laying eggs. Although it should be, I made it enough. I've, you know, I don't know why I said that in a deep voice. Um, so it's, it's how much, it's kind of like you at Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, I've eaten enough, I shouldn't have fourths, but then you do anyway, right? And so it's, it's how much she is dis distended by the volume, because she can't count. She doesn't count the number of mates, she has no way of ascertaining the actual genetic diversity, but the fuller she is, the more likely she's going to be mating with more drones. So that's how it all plays out, is that she's not kind of actively regulating it, but it's these simple um, correlations that she gets filled up with more, probably more mates, probably genetically diverse, and that's how she's able to trigger that pheromonal difference. Isn't that fascinating? Over here. Goodness gracious, that's a great question. The question was, what is the diversity in the commercial population? Does it change throughout the So um, the answer is, or at least my answer is, is that we both have enough diversity out there, plenty of diversity among our bees, but the, the, the system by which we're creating bees is creating genetic bottlenecks. So the, the take home from this is that we're lucky that queens are mating with lots of drones to maintain that diversity. Otherwise, our management practices are actually constantly reducing the diversity. So there's kind of a good and a bad side to it in the sense that I think we have enough diversity out there, but we're also constantly limiting that diversity through our management practices. So we need to balance those two things. Um, I don't have a particular slide, um, but I'll try and add it for this afternoon uh, to show that we have made those comparisons. Um, and I think that it's kind of uh, shocking in some ways, but it's good news in the sense that despite the practices, we still have enough diversity. I'll take one more question before I'm kicked off, right here. So, uh, a great question as far as kind of the, the loading of the spermatheca, whether there's a first male precedent or a last male precedent, and it really does seem egalitarian that the queen, what is represented in the spermatheca is almost an even sampling of all of the drones. And as it goes into the spermatheca, it gets thoroughly mixed. So that when the queen lays an egg and she releases a little bit of the volume of the sperm, it's almost a Monte Carlo situation. It's a, it's a random sampling of her drones. She goes to great lengths to make sure her offspring are genetically diverse, um, rather than having that kind of orderly process 
uh, which again is indicative of how important it is. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.